Good morning. Isn't it wonderful to be in the house of the Lord? Isn't it wonderful to be in the house of the Lord? Say amen. 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 It's good to see everybody this morning. If you will, stand with us as we worship. Sing this with us. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind of weight? It was my doom till I met you. I was free.
welcome. Welcome to Fort Creek Baptist Church. It is great to see you here this morning. I'm excited about the day as the Lord keeps working and speaks to us and uh, prepares us for revival. I hope that you've uh, turned up the spiritual heat in your life just a little bit and you're looking at some challenges this week. You need to challenge yourself. Open your heart. We're going to be talking about that uh, shortly this morning in our preaching time. I want to share with you a verse I heard in Sunday school this morning in Hosea 10 verse 12. It says, sow righteousness for yourselves, reap the fruit of unfailing love, break up your unplowed ground. Some translations, your fallow ground. Break up your unplowed ground. It is time to seek the Lord until he comes and showers his righteousness on you. The best thing I can say to understand that verse is the unplowed ground is talking about your heart dry, lifeless heart. And we are all susceptible to that. We all can move in and out of it in our Christian lives. Uh, we all can be followers of Jesus and fall in love with this world and get into unrighteousness and idolatry and lack of love. And this verse is calling us back. It's telling you what you have to do to be close to the Lord and faithful to him and have him working hard in your heart. So I really challenge you, let this week be a special spiritual renewal, call out to the Lord to prepare you and to get us ready for revival that starts next Sunday. So that's the big announcement this morning, of course. Homecoming is Sunday. I always mesh them, mesh them together. So homecoming is revival Sunday, and then uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday is the official revival. And you know on Sunday we do the big meal. Everybody needs to come and be part of the worship service and part of the meal that morning. Bring a, a well-stocked basket is the way I've seen that expressed. If you bring one dish, that's not enough, unless it's really, really good, and then we, we might give you a pass on the rest of it, right? I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Take out your uh, bulletin, please. Pull off your welcome card with me. I want to encourage you to fill that out and uh, put it in the offering plate, or uh, you can leave it uh, at the front table if you don't have enough time to do that. Also, you'll notice in your bulletin there is a flyer. This is um, to uh, inform you, encourage you, but it really is for you to invite somebody. So you use this, give them to somebody, put it in a window at a business somewhere that people will see it, um, take it to the restaurant and give it to the server, invite them to come and be part of what God's going to do during the week of revival. Let's pray together. Father, we ask that you would open our hearts. We know it's so easy to get off track. It's so easy to love this world or to seek things that are um, bad for us and destructive. We ask for your forgiveness for cleansing in our hearts. We pray that you would bring renewal and strength and encouragement so that we might be better at loving you, at hearing your voice, at knowing your will, at following your word. We might be faithful and righteous and true. Break up the dry places in our hearts and get our focus right where it needs to be. Bring revival to us. Bring revival to the church and let it sweep through to touch the lives of other people. We ask that this would happen in the beginning today, continuing in our hearts. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. If you will, stand with us as we continue to worship.
Stop.
you of gratitude. I want to tell you how much I appreciate your faithfulness in giving. Um, I, I feel like as a pastor, it's a real blessing that you don't have to hound people. You know there are pastors that do that, and there are churches where that has to happen as well. Thank you for your faithfulness in giving. I, I would say it is the summer time, and the summer is a uh, the summer dry period or doldrums or something like that. I'm always kind of shocked how when people go on vacation, they take their tithe with them. Have you ever noticed that? Um, so I am encouraging you, you know, to be faithful. God has called us to give faithfully. The Bible says the Lord loves what kind of giver? A cheerful giver. That's from your heart with great desire and out of love for him. So, so thank you for your faithfulness. Um, keep it up. And be faithful and continue. You put your mic down. Are you praying? You want me to pray? There's no battery. Ah, well. It won't come on. Okay. I'll just talk loud. That'd be fine. I change our 
We come to the Lord's table this morning. I can't think of a better time besides, you know, we do this on Easter, but the week before a planned revival. The Lord's table represents a point of renewal. It's a reminder of who we are as the people of God and what it means to be in relationship with Jesus. I want you to hear a passage from 1 Corinthians 10 that I think helps uh, set the mood and focus our hearts. Paul writes, therefore, my friends, flee from idolatry. Very interesting, he compares idolatry with how we approach the Lord's table. I speak to sensible people, judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body, for we all share the one loaf. He spends the rest of that chapter talking about idolatry and the risks and the dangers of idolatry and the representation of the table that we understand what we are doing. I tell people all the time when we're talking about baptism, baptism doesn't make you a Christian. Taking the Lord's Supper does not make you a Christian. In fact, the Bible says the Lord's Supper is only for Christians. If you eat or drink in an unworthy manner, it's the very next chapter in 1 Corinthians, then you drink and eat judgment upon yourselves. So it is very significant that your heart is prepared, that your mind is focused, that you are inviting the Lord to do the work He needs to do within you. And you are expressing to Him, my heart is for you, I love you, I want all of Jesus to be absorbed within me. And I want to be totally dependent on your sacrifice for every part of my life and every day. So I want to take a minute. We're just going to sit in silence. And you search your heart. Talk to the Lord and prepare yourself as we come to the Lord's table. Amen.
Brent McClure, would you give thanks for the body of Christ, please? The scripture says that the Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, he took the bread, and after he broke it, he gave thanks, and he said, take and eat, this is my body, which is broken for you.
Charles Wilson, would you give thanks for the blood of Christ? that you can show your greatest love. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup and he said, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Lord, we give you all the glory and all the praise. Our lives are for you. You made us, you designed us, you have saved us. And I pray that we would be completely tuned in to your purpose and your kingdom and your will. I pray that you would do it in each of us individually. And then you would allow us to represent what this really means, that we are one in Christ. Together as a church, you can use us to change our community. We desire that and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to take some time with you this morning to focus in on the topic of revival, just to give us some things to think about, some challenge, and uh, we'll pick back up with kingdom relationships. We were actually there last Sunday, though I didn't say it. We were talking about your relationship with uh, the government, with uh, our society from that sense, uh, we're going to discuss some of those concepts further in the weeks ahead after the revival. Steve, I feel like I'm too loud. Could, could you turn me down just a little bit? Or there's a, a reverb echo or something going on that, that's um, challenging. Uh, in your Bibles, I hope you'll turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 6 and chapter 7. I know what time it is, and yes, this is a two-chapter of the Bible sermon. So uh, buckle your seats, hang in there. Many times in our lives, it's easy for someone to say something's wrong. It's easy for people to identify a problem, to find something they're unhappy about, or to complain about the problem. We can recognize it's there. But in fact, it's really too easy to point out problems for most people. But then the hard part is diagnosing the problem. You know the typical response is, don't give me problems, give me solutions. If you want to identify something that's wrong, let's talk about how we're going to fix it, not just sit around and gripe about things that are wrong. I came across what is an actual list of doctor's notes from hospital charts. True, actual, real. Here, let me give you a few examples. Patient has chest pain if she lies on her left side for over a year. Chest pain on her left side. Over a year. The patient has refused autopsy. That's a very interesting one. Note, patient recovering from forehead cut. Patient became very angry when given an enema by mistake. It gets better. On the second day, the knee was better. On the third day, it had disappeared. The patient is tearful and crying constantly. She also appears to be depressed. You think? She is numb from her toes down. Occasional, constant, infrequent headaches. That's rather a contradiction. Patient was alert and unresponsive. Another contradiction. Uh, here's one you'll like. Rectal examination revealed a normal-sized thyroid. I'll give you just a minute to think about the, the implications of that. She stated that she had been constipated for most of her life until she got a divorce. <laughs> Some of you ladies can say amen, I guess. Uh, the patient has been depressed since she began seeing me in 1993. Wonder what's causing her depression. Well, this list goes on and on. These are real. Uh, we have some doctors in the house. Maybe they can verify the silly things that they've seen and experienced. It's very easy to talk about problems very easy to see and know and say something's wrong. It's also easy to miss the real problems and confuse those problems. And it's very difficult 
to have the right solution. It's just like we try to tell people how badly they need Jesus. Just about everybody I've ever talked to knows they're not perfect. They've got issues in their lives, things that aren't working the right way. And you can explain to them what the Bible says and what the great need is and what God has done for them, this amazing sacrifice that he has made, and yet still they will say, don't want any of that. That doesn't sound like a good solution to me. And so they blind themselves. They close off their minds to the truth, even though they can say something's not right. I would tell you as well, as Christians, it's very easy for us to know something's not right, but we wind up somehow not able or not willing to take the necessary step before the Lord to fix what's not right. Something in our soul is not right. The passage in Hosea 10 talks about break up the fallow ground. It's in your heart, the dry places in your heart. You know that those places are there. What do we do? How do we diagnose? How do we understand problems and issues in the Christian life? We all know once you become a Christian, it doesn't get easier, right? It becomes more challenging, more difficult because the enemy's coming after you. You used to be on his team. Once you follow Jesus, now he's against you. And he's working every angle he can to mess you up, to dry you out, to sit you down in a huff so that no growth and no joy and no fruit is what your Christian life becomes. So we're all susceptible to that. and We all kind of slide in and out of that throughout the whole process of trying to be what we're called to be. Second Chronicles, way back in the Old Testament, chapter 6 and chapter 7, gives us a clear formula for diagnosing spiritual problems that we might encounter. Now, let me give you a little background. Not going to read two full chapters. We're going to bounce around a lot in making a list of indicators. These are things that you really need to check out in your own life to know if revival is necessary for you. Or probably better yet, which places make it obvious that revival is necessary for you? Little background. Uh, The passage represents the pinnacle in the Old Testament of Israel. This is the highest of the high. Solomon is the king. You remember David conquered and expanded and built the nation, unified the nation. Solomon came on the throne and he was a master politician and a great leader. He built the temple and established the the place where they could honor the Lord and know his presence was among them. This was the high point. In fact, from this point forward, after Solomon, it's a slow decline. It's actually fast in some ways and in some places. So high point right here for the whole nation of Israel. After that, the decline begins. These two chapters tell us why the decline takes place. And then from this point through the end of the Old Testament, we see the results of a people who name God but turn away from God. A people who say we are the people of God, but we're not going to do anything God tells us to do. We're not going to believe the word. We're not going to read the word. We're not going to worship the Lord. They were involved in so many wicked practices. They're the people of God, but not really. You you understand. A lot of people who go to churches in the United States of America every single Sunday, but they don't know the Lord. They don't know the Lord. They don't have a real relationship with him. They certainly don't love him. They don't understand his word. They don't care about his word. In every church, there are people like that. And those people, if they are truly saved, they need a fire to start in their hearts. That is revival. They need to be awakened. So here we are in this chapter And the definitions are established for what the temple means and how God is going to relate to his people. And he speaks very clearly to them. The first 11 verses, chapter 6, Solomon begins talking to the people. This is the dedication of the temple. So a big nationwide kind of event. He's telling the people what we're doing here. It's like a call to worship. He's describing the temple, what it means, how it's going to work, what they're going to be. Then in verses 12 through 33, 
chapter 6, Solomon kneels on the platform, the high platform, in front of all of these people. Hundreds of thousands, if not millions, of people. And Israel uh, and Jerusalem is, is all mountains. So you could stand all the way up the Mount of Olives and watch Solomon in front of the temple. And then the mountains around on the other sides of Jerusalem. I could imagine them covered in people. They'd been looking forward to the temple this long. They'd been talking about the temple for well over a hundred years. Now it had happened. And Solomon is addressing them. And he prays beginning in verse 12. He asks God to heal and to forgive. And what he's doing is describing what this is about, what this building means, what difference it is supposed to make. And then he tells them very bluntly, when you fall away. Not if, not maybe, not some of you, when you turn your back on the Lord. Here's what you can do. Here is the formula to come back to God. Well, the Lord is so happy with this. In chapter 7, the presence of God falls on the temple in front of all of the people. And you know in the Old Testament, when the presence of God shows up, everybody sees it. It's the smoke, the fire, the, the lightning, the cloud, whatever manifestation. Here it says, the glory of God fell on the place and it was like a blazing fire. And all of these people saw and had this confirmation, our God is the God. No idol's ever done this. Our God is present here among us. Our God deserves our worship. He is worthy of us giving everything to him. And that's the real meaning of the way God reveals himself. Everybody sees it. Then beginning in 7.11, the Lord appears to Solomon privately. And he makes this tremendous promise regarding the temple and the people. You probably know the most famous verse, uh, probably in all of Second Chronicles 7.14. If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their sins four components and then he gives three promises then will I hear from heaven forgive their sin and heal their land this is the revival verse in the Bible uh, I've preached it numerous times I know every single one of you probably has heard more than one sermon on 2nd Chronicles 7 14 so I wanted to back out from that and get the uh, the big picture of why the verse is even there in the first place now, all of chapter 7 and uh, much of chapter 6, too, is God saying to the people, I'm here, I'm with you, I'm real, I deserve your worship, and when you turn your back on me, he tells them, here's what's going to happen. Here are the things that take place as discipline, as challenge, as rebuke. So I want to look at those pronouncements. There are many of them I've um, isolated six, uh, 10 of them I want to go through in the two chapters and understand it in our lives today in a New Testament context and make application about revival and where we really need to be focusing this week before next week. So revival is necessary when? And there are 10 of these that we need to examine in our own lives. Look at chapter 6, verse 18 through 21. Will God really dwell on the earth with humans? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Yet, Lord my God, give attention to your servant's prayer and his plea for mercy. Hear the cry and the prayer that your servant is praying in your presence. May your eyes be open toward this temple day and night. This place of which you said you would put your name there. May you hear the prayer your servant prays toward this place. Hear the supplications of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray toward this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place and when you hear, forgive. The real key thing for me as Solomon begins the prayer is just looking at the heart of Solomon. I see it in these four verses. It's the heart of Solomon. He is passionate about who he is and about how he's trying to focus the people on the Lord. What is the uh, indicator for the re necessity of revival? It is a case of the spiritual blahs. When you lose your passion, when you don't have any energy for the Lord. When you wake up and say, oh, it's Sunday, do, do, we, do we have to go to church this week? 
That's a lack of passion. It's a lack of energy. You're just going through the motions. When you realize, <clears throat> you know, I spend more time on social media than I do in God's Word or in prayer. You know, I watch more TV than I spend at all thinking about the Lord or trying to serve Him. This is a case of the spiritual blahs. You wind up just kind of going through the motions. Uh, you don't love Jesus like you should. And you realize that that is the case. Most likely, you realize it because you know there used to be a time when you loved him so much more. You can point back to a time where there was a passion, an energy, a, a, a commitment level in your life. And when you find yourself going through the spiritual blahs, you know something's got to happen. If you are in a marriage that is fruitless and unhappy and you go to some kind of counseling, you want to pay a high-dollar therapist, they're going to tell you you've got to find a spark. You've got to, you've got to hit, hit something hard to make it kind of burst into energy and joy again. You've got to find something to stir your heart. That's no different here. You're in a love relationship with Jesus, not a religious obligation. It's a love relationship, so it's got to work with passion and energy and renewal and strength and yearning in your heart. When it's not there, you've got to find the spark. The spark is revival. It is necessary. Number two, revival is necessary when circumstances have turned sour. When the circumstances of your life <coughs> have turned sour. 6.24, <clears throat> when your people Israel have been defeated by an enemy because they have sinned against me. Those are external circumstances. Something bad has happened. The circumstance here is a battle. Israel lost the battle. In fact, this was a recurring experience for Israel after they began to turn their back on the Lord. The next king after Solomon in the northern part of the kingdom uh, was not a follower of God or the Old Testament. He went straight to idolatry. His name was Jeroboam. And every king after him in the north is compared to Jeroboam. And every time it says he did evil in the eyes of the Lord following the ways of his father Jeroboam. They turned hard and fast against the Lord. And the Lord allowed circumstances to turn against them. So one of the key things you can look at in your life is the things happening to you. Now, I'm not saying that this is a, a, an absolute, perfect kind of one-for-one -one relationship. Bad thing happens, God's mad at me. I'm not saying that. However, if you're in a consistent pattern of defeat, you've got to pause, kind of pull back and say, okay, what does this mean? Is there a message here? Is the Lord trying to tell me something? Is there something I need to look at in my own heart? Do I need to evaluate where I'm at and what my commitment is? Am I faithful to Him? Do I love Him? Am I listening to Him? So defeat, that is an ongoing kind of thing, is something that really ought to make you start to ask those kinds of questions. If your circumstances go bad, that's an indicator that something is wrong. And you've got to be able to evaluate it. Revival is the need. Number three, you know you need revival when there is a lack of fruit in your life. In the passage before us, Solomon talks about those times when the land does not produce. And why would that be? Oh, it's just the weather patterns. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God uses even the productivity of your lives, the fruit of your lives, to teach you and to inform you and to discipline you. So here, 626, he says, When the heavens are shut up and there is no rain, the crops aren't coming in, the uh, environment is not cooperating. Well, who controls the environment? Joe Biden does not control the environment, okay? Uh, the global warming scientists tell you whatever they tell you. Uh, I can't imagine anybody that thinks man can change the environment and the weather. That seems to me the most ludicrous, foolish thing in the world. God is in control of this. And if things aren't going well, he might be trying to tell us something. 
If there's no fruit in your life, if there's no productivity. 628 mentions famine, blight, mildew, locusts, grasshoppers. Let's read that verse actually. Did I put that on the screen? I did. When famine or plague comes to the land, or blight or mildew, locusts or grasshoppers, or when enemies besiege them in all of their cities, whatever disaster or disease may come. This is when the fruit, the things you're working on, the effort that you're investing is petering out. It's being thwarted. Something's coming against it. You feel like you're constantly bumping up against the wall. That didn't work. I'm going to try this. That didn't work. I'm going to try that. And you don't feel any sense of accomplishment. This is generally a sign of the discipline of God. In fact, John 15, 16 Jesus said, I chose you and appointed you to go and bear fruit that will last. We have a calling, a responsibility, and equipping from the Lord. It's not just a verse about, hey, you got to work hard to tell lost people about Jesus, though that's there. This is a verse saying, fruitfulness is your thing. You're supposed to be bearing fruit. So if you're not, then that's against the way God is trying to design and work in our lives. So lack of fruit, necessity of revival. Number four is when you are under discipline. 629 talks about each person aware of his afflictions and his pains. This is when Jesus loses his place in your life. His response isn't just to go and sit quietly in a corner. If Jesus loses his place in your life, he loves you enough to start tapping you on the shoulder. And then start tapping you on the head. And then what I call the spiritual, actually I call it the Holy Spirit two by four. Okay, this is how the Lord has often gotten my attention. This is how he called me into the ministry. Uh, I know you've heard every pastor say my answer was no and not me and who you talking to. Well, that was me too. And then he whopped me upside the head with the Holy Spirit two by four. When that happens to you, you need to have the spiritual perception to say, God's trying to get my attention. If you're not noticing, then it's going to come again. Why? Because Jesus is in your heart, and he loves you, and he has said, nobody's going to pluck you out of his hand, which also means you can't pluck yourself out of his hand if you are a true follower of Christ. So if you're trying to go against him in a different direction, he will not let you go. He's going to stay at it. You be, become under discipline, under discipline. Here's number five. Revival is necessary when you are missing his presence. Look at 716. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Uh, one of the big mistakes the Jews made was to worship the temple and to feel complacency because God lives in that building and so Jerusalem is safe forever. Jeremiah mocks them. He said to them, you guys go up saying, this is the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. It's actually one of my favorite statements in the Old Testament because it really shows how easily we can deceive ourselves. How easily we can say, you know, God's on my side. Everything's going to be fine. The Lord would never let something bad or difficult happen to me. Well, the fact is, and Solomon's telling us here and told all of them, that's not true. If you turn your back on him, then things happen in your life to get your attention and call you to revival. So his presence was represented by the building. That was the true meaning of it. You look at the temple and you say, God is among us. God loves us. He is our God. He has a call and a purpose in my life. If you as a Christian wind up feeling a sense of emptiness, or you go, you know, I haven't prayed in a while. I haven't heard the Lord speak to me the way he used to. I, I don't have a desire for his word. I don't spend any time with him. These are indicators of uh, a lack of presence. You've fallen kind of into the doldrums, and that presence missing means you need revival. You need revival. The next one, number six, you know revival is necessary when there's no joy in your life. I feel like I could preach this sermon every single Sunday. 
Because number one, the world beats us down constantly. Number two, like I said last Sunday, I'm convinced we're living in very, very difficult times to be faithful to Jesus. So I get that. The number three reason, though, is most Christians seem to love sourpuss sadness a whole lot more than they love the joy of the Lord. It just kind of seems natural for us to come to church with an old dried up face. We're really good at that. Somebody probably lives with us thinking, would you please get a little joy in your life? Things would be so much better. Well, here's the great news. Joy is a fruit of the Spirit. Did you know that? In fact, it's the second one in the list. You can go to Galatians 5 and look this up. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy. Joy. The Holy Spirit is a joy factory. He's pumping that into you all the time. And for you to suppress that is a lot of hard work. (laughs) You're actually working against the Lord. 641 here in 2 Chronicles talks about rejoicing. May your saints rejoice in your goodness. If you don't have any joy, you cannot be walking in good fellowship with the Lord. You just cannot be. We're promised in the New Testament that you can have joy in the midst of the worst circumstances. The worst circumstances. We know people, every one of us, who has been some, through some kind of medical emergency. We know people who have been significantly impacted by bad circumstances. We know people who have no legs or no arms or are bedridden and you are in their presence and you see the joy of the Lord all over them. We know people who are in prison who love the Lord now and are devoted and carry the joy. We know people who go to foreign countries and live under terrible circumstances, suffer much greater persecution than we suffer in America, and they are filled with the joy of the Lord. It has nothing to do with circumstances. Quit making excuses. If you don't have any joy, you need Revival. Here's the next one. Number seven is captivity. Captivity. Look at 636. When they sin against you, when the people sin against you, Solomon is praying, for there is no one who does not sin, and you become angry, God, with them. And what does God do? You give them over to the enemy who takes them captive. Now, this is a physical captivity, but I want to apply it as a spiritual captivity to understand there is such a thing. You can become captive spiritually to some dominating, controlling power. It's generally something you wind up giving yourself to, and then that thing gets, it, gets its hooks in you, and it starts to grow around you, and you become more and more constrained and locked in and controlled by whatever that worldly thing is. You are captive to it, and it is uh, having this massive power in your life. It might be a bad habit that won't let up and you somehow can't seem to overcome. It might be the wandering mind every time you try to read God's Word. It might be uh, your sense, your foreboding that things are bad, they're only going to get worse, and and that's all there is, and you're never going to be happy. It might be a a bondage to some type of, um, of device or a substance or issue or anything that that is constantly allowed to have power in your life it's not just there for you to have fun it is there to take you over and to destroy you and once you become captive to it you need a breakout revival you need it desperately here's number eight you need revival when there is idolatry in your life So if I wanted to pick one of these um, that I'm pretty sure, pretty confident that would hit every single one of us, this is the one. This is the one. How can I say that? Because we live in a world where there is sin and evil. We live in a world where there's temptation in front of us all the time. We live in a world that is chasing after that temptation and evil with all of its energy and passion. We live in a world where we have an enemy who wants to see you fall, stumble, decline, fail, defeated. And so idolatry is the tool that is so often uh, given access in our lives. Something that you love more 
than Jesus. Or even something that just competes with your love for Jesus. 719, uh, if you turn away from the Lord and go off to serve other gods and worship them. That's the definition of idolatry. 722, because they have forsaken the Lord our God and have embraced other gods. This is actually the strongest language in these two chapters. It's not just if this thing happens, if the crops aren't coming in, if you lose a battle, uh, if you're um, not focused how you ought to be. Now it's you have rejected the God who has made his presence among you. You have rejected the God who is so powerful and so interested in you that he would whoosh, drop into your midst with a dynamic, powerful, visible fire cap. How many times maybe have you said, why doesn't God just make himself known? Well, he did in that case. And what did they do? They turned their backs on him and walked away. That might be why God doesn't make his way known that way. Do you think? Because it really doesn't make any difference. The call's got to be to your soul and to your deep commitment. I'm going to love the Lord. I'm going to be faithful to Him. How, after all He's done for me, could I ever reject Him and chase after anything else? Idolatry is easy to spot, brothers and sisters. It's very easy, very simple test. What gets your time? What gets your passion? What gets your money? And you'll know what you love. You'll know what you love. You'll know what's your number one thing, and you'll find out. And it's always at risk in our lives. If you're falling on your face before an idol, come back to Jesus. You need revival. Here's number nine. You know revival's necessary when you have to ask yourself, where's your Bible? Now, I don't mean that literally, I forgot what shelf I put it on. I mean spiritually, um, where's the Bible in your uh, sense of time, in your uh, efforts to find the Lord, in the way you live your life? Is there a place in there for God's Word? Where's the Bible? 719 says, if you turn away and forsake the decrees and the command I have given you. If you turn your back on the Word of God. And you reject his truth. Imagine the fearfulness that ought to put so many um, people these days, so many churches actually too, that are drifting in their theology. They're going after whatever the, the latest fad theology is, whatever the new sexuality is, and they get um, invested in, well, we want to look right in front of people. We don't want anybody saying say anything bad about us. We don't want to be kicked off of social media. Um, thankfully, the Lord doesn't need social media to reach people and change lives. In fact, I'm pretty sure social media is far greater a tool of the devil than it is of the kingdom of God. So we've got to understand this focus on the Word of God and the need to to have it in front of us uh, and understand it with everything that we have. I think we are in a serious day of biblical um, confusion, of biblical um, misunderstanding. People don't know God's Word. I'm talking about church people now. They don't love God's Word and they don't care. How in the world are they ever going to be able to hear from the Lord and follow him? Here's the last one, number 10. And it is the the necessity of a revival when you're facing the death of a church. Now, I put this on the list because it's in these two chapters. It's boldly stated in these two chapters. And yes, it's the same thing we talked about last Sunday. But I I want to um, reemphasize again, uh, 720, I will uproot Israel from the land. I will uproot Israel from the land which I have given them, and I will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. I know everybody here last Sunday remembers everything we talked about last Sunday. Amen, Pastor. I know you remember we talked about the fact that if God had brought judgment on Israel and rejected them and allowed them to lose their even status as a nation for about 2,000 years, If God would allow that to happen, then why would we think he would not allow that to happen to God's people today? And the real question is, at what point 
have we gotten far enough away from him and silenced him to the greatest degree and rejected his truth before God says, okay, enough. If you are a student of the end times in the Bible, um, Revelation, Daniel, First and Second Thessalonians, uh, if you're following uh, how the Bible lines up with the end times, you understand that that is exactly how we get to the Antichrist. There is a great apostasy that will take place when those people, many of them who call themselves Christians, but are clearly not really Christians, you know what apostasy means? It is a falling away. It is a rejection. It is an absolute, I said I believed in Jesus, not anymore. What is going to happen when people kneel at the hands of the Antichrist and they get ready to stamp the mark? You know what they're going to have to do. They're going to have to say, I don't love Jesus. I don't believe in Jesus. I don't need Jesus. But Antichrist, you're my guy. Revelation 13, you can look that up too. That day is coming, and it clearly is coming. The fact of the matter right now, and what we need to really focus ourselves on, is that um, God... As much as he would judge Israel, he would judge us the same way. And there's always this danger. There's always this risk. And it ought to make the need for revival obvious. Our church needs revival. Our community, every church I know about needs revival. I don't know of one that's exploding and going powerfully and blessed um, extensively like we used to see churches 20, 30 years ago. Every church I know about needs revival. And the fact is, every church is at risk of not being a church anymore. It does happen. It does happen. And it is actually happening a lot these days. And clearly, when a church is about to close its doors, that would be a pretty clear indicator of the need for revival. It's a dangerous thing to think about. Never forget that churches can die they can take down the sign they can turn off the power they can close up the house the old preacher used to say they write Ichabod right across the door frame that's from the story of Eli when God allowed Israel to be defeated and he allowed uh, the the Ark of the Covenant to be taken by the Philistines and um, the pronouncement was Ichabod the glory of God has departed God's not here anymore Now think about that because 2 Chronicles 6 and 7 is about God being here. God has established his presence. And yet right here in 720, he says, I will reject this temple I have consecrated for my name. I said I would be there, but if you guys make it hard enough for me that I can't be there, then I'm leaving. That's what God is saying. And so we have to search and examine and evaluate our hearts When God has issued his final call for the people to wake up and get right, and the call is left unheeded again, there's real danger for that church to no longer be a church. Sometimes the problem is dissension and infighting that's never resolved. Every church seems to have some silly little thing that they are fighting about or that they used to fight about. Some silly, ridiculous thing that's going to wind up destroying the church. Sometimes the church simply stops caring about lost people. They don't invite anybody. They don't look at anybody with a spiritual interest. They're not loving their neighbors. They're not representing Jesus to the people around them. Sometimes there is a systemic sin in the midst of the people. And that sin, when it's not addressed, it just kind of grows and grows. And it destroys the church. Sometimes it has started with one of these other nine issues that we've already talked about. But we have to always be, where's my church? Are we faithful to God? Is our heart what it ought to be as the people of God? We are all individually called to serve Him and know Him and love Him. But collectively, we're supposed to be a dynamic powerhouse, a force for the Spirit of God to change the world around us. We have a calling to that level. And how many churches do we see reaching that potential? Not many. Not many. I'm going to tell you something. I think in McDuffie County, this church is way at the top of the list of potential. Look at the people we have 
here. Look at the statistics. Look at what we did in vacation Bible school. Yes, I know it would be easy to say it's not the same, Pastor. Things have changed. You want to know my answer to that? Good. Good. Change is happening all the time. If things have changed, it's because God's opening a new door, bringing in a new direction, and that's his purpose and his design. I can tell I struck a nerve there. Y'all still with me? Got to get our hearts right. We've got to be the church he's called us to be. We've got to go through everything we're about with an expectation for him to work, to be present, to show up, to speak, to straighten us out. And then to use us in the tremendous ways that he intends to use us, the things that he wants to do. I'm just going to tell you quite honestly, the problem with most churches, if if not all, is the church. It's not the community. They're doing what they're supposed to do. It's not the location. Here we are out in the, the sticks. Nobody could find us except we, you know, have to work hard to make them know where we are. That doesn't even matter. It's not the uh, culture of the day. God can work in ways that is shocking and overwhelming. In fact, the only time God works is when it's shocking and overwhelming. If things are just going through the motions and stay the same, and you have a little bit of this and a little bit of that, 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 that's just the church kind of hanging on. That's not the church fulfilling its purpose. When something odd happens that is according to Scripture, fits with God's Word, and and you're going, wow, how did that happen? You can say, what is God doing there? We need some of those wows, wouldn't you say? We need something that is shocking, that is challenging, that is amazing. Let me say this. I don't want it to come out the wrong way. But if I showed up here on a Sunday night for worship and there were 40 people sitting in this room, that would be a wow God moment for me. Right? I am not that kind of preacher that wants to point this bony finger and say, you've got to be at church this many times. I, I, I don't do that. I would never do that. But at the same time, it is an indicator. In most churches, Sunday nights is dying. I'm not picking on you guys. I'm talking about the whole, the whole shooting match. It's like people don't have an interest in the Word of God, the presence of the Spirit, the worship. They don't even want to be a part of it. They got something better to do on Sunday nights. Just one example. Don't take it the wrong way. God, I pray that you'd help us. I pray that you'd speak to us in a way that uh, gets our attention. You're the God of the universe. Surely there is some great power and great presence and great work you want to do right here at Fort Creek Baptist Church. Get our hearts ready for you to do it. Make us desire it, God. Whatever you see in us, we give you permission to change that thing. If that's necessary, for your spirit to show up, for your presence to dwell among us, for something to happen that we all can see and say, look, look what God has done. Look how great he is. Bring your blessing, Lord. Bring your power. But if it's got to start with conviction, bring your conviction, God. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to invite you to respond. Maybe you just need to sit where you are. Be in a spirit of prayer. Lord, what what is this about me directly? There's ten things here. Maybe one of them is you. Maybe more than one. Which one is mine, God? Where is my heart? What is my desire for you? Do I love you like I should? Am I faithful like I should be? Do I believe in you? Is there any joy in my life? You call out to him. and Tell him you want it to change. Ask Him to work on you this week and get us us all ready for this coming time next week. If you need to come to the altar, please come. I know how late it is. Don't worry about that. Please come. If you need to speak with me during this time, I invite you to do that.
let's stand together. I want to thank you for being here today. I hope um, you'll come back this evening and uh, join us. I know the youth are doing a special thing. Our kids will be here tonight, and we'll be worshiping at 6.30. You got something, Brother Liam? Okay. Eight o'clock Tuesday morning. All right. Thank you, sir. I'm going to ask uh, Brian Ussery, would you close us in prayer this morning, please?